Um, there's, there's a problem with many people when it comes to the scriptures, and this will come up every time you talk to somebody who is an atheist. Uh, you know, if I bring up this concept of can the modern scientists, you know, ser take uh, seriously the biblical account of creation, uh, most people would say you can't. I mean, you, it used to be if you were a creationist, you would be sort of ostracized. I don't know if anybody has ever been to a meeting where somebody that you thought was a friend didn't want to spend time around you. But I've had that happen at science meetings uh, where people that I knew very well really did not want me hanging around them. And I, I don't have any hard feelings about this, you know. Uh, it was a little harder because this was somebody who used to be a member of the church. And so I realized that a lot of what I'm doing is really designed to help people who don't understand all the issues and get them to see that there is this middle ground. You know, I, I just, uh, I can't emphasize enough that ultimately your faith is going to be based on the miracles of the Bible. You're either going to believe them or you, or you won't. And if you can't believe the miracles of the Bible, there's no use in believing the miracle of Christ being raised to be our Savior, and there's no reason to live like that. <laughs> you, have the, you have the option of living as sinful as you want to if you take that point of view. Everybody has a right to do that. I don't recommend it. I think that's a hard way to go. It's not a good way to live in this life. God made our bodies. He created our bodies in the entire world. And he knows best how to fit all of that together by telling us how to live our lives. So, um, you know, you just can't talk about general evolution without the Bible coming up, and you can't talk about the Bible without general evolution coming up. So you better be prepared to deal with each one. One of the classic uh, complaints and challenges to what I believe is that the Bible was passed down by man and there was no way that it didn't have mistakes in it. And so you're really just going by a book of man. And I want to show you uh, how you can be assured that the Bible that you have in your hands uh, is the actual word that came to the apostles and prophets and know it for sure. So you never question it again. It is, it is, it is, and you won't have to worry about it. I first started thinking about this approach uh, back when uh, we played that game called Gossip or Telephone or whatever it was. Everybody had a different name for it. So you would whisper something in Nancy's ear, not the same thing he whispers in Nancy's ear, but you would whisper something in Nancy's ear and then she would whisper it in his ear and it would just go around the room. And then you'd have the last person stand up and say what it was, and of course everybody would just break down in laughter. You know, I did that. I would do that with Bible passages in my lessons, and it was pretty funny. It'd get about four down, and somebody would make a mistake, and then by the time, well, as far as it got, usually it didn't get to the end. It was just completely butchered. Nobody had any idea what it was. And obviously, scribes would have been much more uh, accurate because they were sort of the, the photocopiers of their day. They, they were artists. They weren't, they weren't just writers. They, they were putting down the shape of that letter exactly the way it was to make that copy. So they were trying to be the photocopier of all of these things. If it doesn't mean they couldn't make a mistake. So that's most people's conception of how we got the Bible. It was passed down, it was passed down, it was passed down. And I want to try to get that across to you so that you can know that what you have in your hands is actually what was delivered to the apostles and prophets by God. Uh, I've mentioned this before. There's a lot of different views of general evolution and origins. All right. Uh, you know, I happen to be uh, someone who believes that the biblical... Uh, not not flat earth, I, I can't, honestly, I can't read that from here. <laughs> not geocentrism, but I, I just believe that what the Bible says about that seven-day creation 
uh, six-day creation and resting on the seventh day is absolutely true. And I have no reason to question it. And my, my point to people who have trouble with that is, you know, if you make the day longer, then in essence you make the days of Second Peter 3 longer and the days of Jesus uh, being in the grave longer. And if you can make them a thousand years, then basically Jesus has been in the grave for 2,000 years and he'll be raised in another thousand. So you've got to be careful about using these passages like that. Everything, uh, and I'll talk about this when we deal with uh, theistic evolution, but every modifier that you could possibly have to let you know that what was meant was a 24-hour day is in Genesis. Every single thing you would use to modify it, you know, times of the day, light and dark, numbering them, and so on, they're all in the Genesis account. And so we know that what the Bible was trying to say to us is that God created in six days, and then he rested on the seventh. It's a miracle. We were recreated in baptism. You know how? Well, I know that the sins of the flesh were cut away, but I have no idea how that was how that happened you know so you you just have to accept the miracles of the bible so i i pointed this out once uh before uh about that particular thing and i showed you that whatever your own view is are the colored glasses you wear to look at all the other views so you can see how complex this gets all right it would be this number to that power wouldn't it and that's a lot so the point is, you have to decide, did God speak to us, and did he speak to us through the scriptures, and are they accurate? And once you come to that conclusion, then you have the option to study it. You don't have to study it. You know, I, somebody told me today, we were in the church building, uh, because I left my keys in the church building on Wednesday night, Sunday night, which had the key to my house and the key to the church building. You know, you can't get back in the church building after you've left it in there. And of course, I'm going to blame Darlene. You know, it obviously, that's the obvious way to go. But I had to call somebody from the other side of town to come over and open the building for me because the keys I took from the garage were not the keys to the house. They were a couple of keys from Eastern Eastern Kentucky University. I was feeling really stupid there for a while. So anyway, um, this whole concept of, uh, I was actually going someplace at that point. Where was I going? Oh, wait a minute. It's called circumstantial reasoning. You, you just sort of, and then eventually you get back. It's a psychological thing. Well, anyway. We have all of these different ways of looking through it. What I was going to say was that Joe, when he was at the building, you know, I was talking to him about this book, which I think is phenomenal. There's a King James Version and there is an NIV Version of the four Gospels where they're put together in the columns, which may be one of the best books that any Christian could have. Because when you get to a passage... You know, it's based on one book and all the rest are t tied to it. You know whether it was said in all the Gospels or just one of the Gospels. I mean, a lot of John is not in any of the others. And it's very, very helpful when they do coincide with one another to see the difference in the details. And it's easy to forget that. And I've had people say, why, why do we have four Gospels? And I'm convinced it is because even preachers get confused and they have to go back and read again. I think God did that on purpose. He gave us four and it just made us, where is that? It doesn't say it exactly like I remember it and then we have to go looking. Well, anyway, I want to tell you something that happened. And I'll come back to that illustration in a little bit. You know, that whole idea of what we talked about in that gossip game. Because that pretty much depresses me. You know, to think that those kind of mistakes could be made. I had a, there was a, a Julian Alexandris put this in the Lexington Herald. Now, I am not, I don't have a bent towards writing editorials in response to people. 
uh, because sometimes they're just too complex. This one I couldn't let pass, so I'm going to read it. The other day, I flipped through some fascist propaganda magazine, Citizen Focus on the Family. Having read the lies in this publication, I must say something. Well, I think he didn't like it. I'm just going to make a wild guess there. The, Bi the Bible is a book, and it was written by human beings. This is no more obvious than what's next, but some people just don't get it. The Bible being a book written by human beings is not much different from any other book available. The fact that the authors of the Bible claim to know more than the reader doesn't make them much different from any other author or authors. All the information one can get from a book, one can get from its author or authors. Belief in a book is belief in what someone else has to say. Christians don't believe in the Word of God. They believe in the Word of the authors of the Bible who were mere fellow human beings. That's really quite a simple concept. Well, I, I just couldn't let that go. Now, this is a tactic of uh, speakers, and that is to put something out there but not answer it till later. Will that ex excite you sufficiently tonight? I'll come back to that. I just couldn't let that pass because that's simply not true. It's just a statement that is not true. What it does is it simply leaves the spiritual side of man completely out of it. Lots of people want to do that. And the reason I brought that up about being shunned at meetings is I, I had one fellow who uh, became the chair of our department in biology who said, why don't, why don't you just accept theistic evolution that God created through evolution? And I said, I can. And I said, I want you to understand that after they have found some way to get creationists out of our faculties, they will get people who are theistic evolutionists out of our faculties. And that has now begun to happen. So it doesn't make any difference. If you want to be a biologist, you can't do it. If you want to be a medical doctor, it's okay. You know, if you want to be a biologist, you can't do it. You want to be a psychologist, you can't do it. You want to be a dentist or a nurse, not a problem. There's no logic in all of this. So I, I'm just, I have stuck to my guns and just kind of quietly done this study over the years. And I will come back to that. And this is where I wrote back. I don't really want to read it right now. I think I'll read it a little later. Um, no, I'll read it right. You, are you ready for that, or do you want me to wait? Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think you really want to anyway. What? <laughs> You're saying that I'm playing with you. I, I think that's rude. <laughs> oh, that's what your wife says too. <laughs> anyway, uh, in response to that letter, people wrote the Bible. The fact that the Bible is recognized as a book makes it special and unique. You understand where I'm going with that? It's a book, and it's special and unique. And so the question is why? Because it's actually a collection of books. It's a library of literature that covers nearly 2,000 years. It represents the writing of 40 different writers who lived in different cultural envir environments. Yet the unity of thought and the theme uh, are characteristic of a book with a single author. Could that have happened by coincidence? A comparable modern work, and this is the thing that I feel like I've added to help people, a comparable modern work is the collection known as the Great Books of the Western World. It's also a library. It represents 2,500 years with 74 authors. This is something I actually have, have on my shelves. At this point, the similarity ends. The Great books lack the unifying themes characteristic of the Bible. God, man, Satan, sin, and redemption are inextricable, inextricably woven within the fabric of each biblical writing. The unity of thought and purpose, the lack of contradiction, and the amazing predictive elements are reasons to consider seriously uh, the claim uh, that each biblical author was directed by a unifying intelligence. The great books will never be known as the great book of the Western world. You have to remember, Bible means book. If people look at it as a book for a very good reason. Uh, the, uh, the distinction, that distinction rests with the Bible. 
uh, may we look beyond the diverse individuals who pen the books of the Bible to the source of its unity, a God of authorship and authority using the characteristic, um, I'm sorry, uh, vocabulary and style of these human instruments to reveal his will to his creation. Now, actually, I think it's a little longer than it's supposed to be, but they put it in in its entirety. They didn't edit it. And I never heard from him. Now, and every once in a while, I've got another one that I will answer, but it came out last year by a Baptist preacher over in Frankfurt, which was pretty rough and kind of surprising, really kind of surprising for me. So this is the way I would answer him, okay? If the Bible is just a work of man, I, I just want you to think, if we just, not out of different cultures, but if we just took 40 different sound preachers in the church and they all wrote 40 different articles would you see them as one long article with no contradictions well then spread that over 15 to 2000, 2000 years 1500 years with 40 different writers who were in very different cultural contexts and yet when you put their works together, which was done by the Jews, they put the canon together as it, as it was uh, presented. If you, put the, if you put the canon together like that, you see this unity. You start out with God and man and sin and uh, redemption. You know, all of that, those themes, those five themes run through everything. You've got Satan. I think I left Satan out a minute ago. I wish it was that easy. Um, but you have those five themes, and they're there from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And there are no contradictions. You can, you can prove to yourself there's no contradictions because your Bible tells you if it wasn't in one of the uh, earliest documents. And there's about ten of those, I think, in the New Testament, maybe. Not a one of which deals with any uh, doctrinal issue. This verse is not in, but there's plenty of other verses, for instance, that deal with the same concept. So uh, that's sort of how I answer it. And I hope that that builds your faith just a little bit, that the book we have really was delivered from the unifying thought of God through these different instruments using their writing style and their vocabulary. But there is nothing else like it. The closest thing would be the great books, and there is no way. You don't have to go very far into great books to look under a particular subject and find out there's not a lot of agreement there. There's certainly no consistency. Well, anyway, uh, I just believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, I do want to get to the Hebrew word yom, which is the word for day. And uh, day one, light. Day two, water and sky, you know, you could probably almost quote the entire first chapter. And then on, on the uh, seventh day, God rested from his labors, and he saw what he had created, and he called it good, basically what it says. Very short, very concise, and very accurate. You just have to believe in miracles. You have to believe in the power of God. And I believe in the power of God. You know, we have a program uh, on called Person of Interest on TV. Now, I don't know whether you all watch that or whether you don't like that or whatever. I'm not trying to offend anybody. But I find it rather fascinating because the, the bottom tenet of the whole thing is that this computer program was written that covers and has knowledge of every person in the world and where they are and what's happening, and it will spit out numbers to say these are people who, there's, they're either going to be killed or they're going to kill somebody. You know, and I thought about that. I want you to think about the idea of a God who can know every thought of every person of the 8 billion that live on the face of the earth in any language. That's what's really amazing to me. In any language. Any cultural differences, you know, the 13 different kinds of Chinese and things like that. Uh, there's just, it's mind-boggling. Well, if, if we can, if we can uh, think like that, 
that passes us into the area of science fiction. We move from science to science fiction. But the problem is that basically what we're saying is that every molecule and atom that is in the Earth can be explained away. We just have to build a big enough supercomputer to figure out when the cue ball hit everything, how did it go? That would be the Big Bang. And so that becomes a little bit uh, more of a faith issue than I think people see. And I don't, I don't mind saying I believe on faith. I just I started all of this because I told my advanced evolutionary theory professor, yes, I believe on faith, but it's a reasoned faith, and I think I can take this same evidence and explain it in a different way. And when I got done with my presentation, you may not remember me saying this earlier, he said, well, Aiken, you did what you said. You you showed that what I believe is on faith too. He basically was an atheist, a secular uh, humanist at least. And so, uh, of course, he went back on that in class the next day practically, two days down the road. But he saw my point. We all believe on faith. We look at the evidence and we must interpret it. And it's a faith issue. So uh, this is not the, the big deal. I want to talk about the word Yom. Yom Kippur, many of you have heard that Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur. And uh, Yom is the word. Every language has a word for day. And in every language, I've studied Hungarian, I've studied Latin and Greek, French, Spanish, uh, well, there's more than that. French, German, Spanish, I don't know, that's enough. Botanical Latin, regular Latin, I don't know. I, I've just fooled with languages all the time. But what I've seen in every language is there's a word for day. And the only way you can know whether it means a long period of time, like in my grandfather's day, or it means a 24-hour day, is what? What would you point to? What would you want? How, if I say, you know, you say, well, did you have a good day today? What, what would tell you that you meant a day? You specified two days. Yeah, you actually usually say, how was today or how was last week? You sort of specify it with something that modifies it and allows you to see that. And the context when you say, have you had a good day, the context of that culture culturally makes it clear to us. But if you only had the word day, you could have a long period of time. And that is not the argument. Don't get off on that argument. What it is is uh, the word day can mean a long period of time. And in my grandfather's day or my grandfather's grandfather's great-grandfather's ancestors did say, you know, I know that, you know, we're all on Jedi or genie or whatever you want to call it, all this documentation of our heritage. Uh, so I would say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I would say at least first day, second day, third day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, we have names. They used to number days. That's very, very clear. If you look in the context and you see words like evening and morning of the first day or light and dark, you know, those are all indicators that basically you're dealing with a 24-hour day. And that's, you go back and read that part of the Jess account, you're going to be amazed because virtually every one of the things you could modify it with is there. So what you can say is you may not think the day is 24 hours, but that's what the Bible says. And you can show people why you say that. I do that because it's the same thing as saying it's my birthday. You don't think of that as a long period of time. It's my birthday on the 21st, and you can bring cards. If I'm not here on the 21st, you can bring them late. Gifts, gifts are fine. So anyway, I want to, I want to just look at this idea of God creating. Science has really fascinated people because of the technology and the results of the technology. I mean, I have got to admit, I love this picture, okay? This is our moon 
and from the other side of the moon, they're looking back across at the earth. That is just stunning to me. It's one of those beyond my imagination kind of things. Yet in physics, you know, you can take classical physics and you can get somebody to the moon by creating the right technology. And the technology really fascinates people when it comes to uh, biology or astronomy or uh, virtually anything. And that's part of the reason the kids don't like it. You have a new language you have to learn. You know, I call it biobabble or geobabble or chemobabble. You know, you've got a whole language you've got to learn. You have to learn a new language with new words in a new context with lots of words for instrumentation. You know, you, if you if you don't know what a tunnel, uh, what a excuse me, a tunnel. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. A tunnel electron microscope is. Then you won't understand the things that they can do with that. You got to know what technology they use. They can now actually get down and look at something as small as a molecule. They publish those pictures now. And it's just beyond grasping for me. So people really get fascinated by it. And the space program was one of those things. And all the stuff where they go to Mars. You know, I have a picture now of a sunset on Mars, you know, in case I decide to go there on vacation. At this point, there's not a single thing that would tell you that life could exist on Mars. And that's a separate issue. But we're going to keep looking because we've convinced ourselves that we're not the only life in the universe. Doesn't mean it's that way. We just have convinced ourselves. So it's all a matter of faith. But science has had the edge with the technology. These are the lights of the Earth from space at night. What they've done is they've taken thousands and thousands of satellite photographs without any clouds in there, and they've put them together uh, all the way around the Earth so that you don't see the daylight. Everything's in darkness. You can pretty, make, pretty much make out, you know, North and South America and Africa and Europe and Asia and so on. It's not too hard to do that. It's kind of amazing. And we are the only species on the face of the earth that has ever developed the ability to, to wipe ourselves out. Literally. We can destroy our environment to such an extent that we could all die from our own activities. We certainly are affecting it now. But this is just fascinating. I mean, that's just a great picture. I'd put that on my Facebook if I took it. So we talk about things that people laugh at, like the flood. What's wrong with this picture? There's the ark. This is the kind of picture we show to our kids. What does it show, and what's wrong with it? The ark was at rest. Yeah, the ark was at rest at some point, but it, it, was in, it was in the waters for a year. But it's the boat itself. There's something wrong with the boat. It looks like a modern-day boat, but it's not built that way. Right. It has a keel. It has a round bottom. And there's nothing in the scriptures that says that. In fact, most people have decided it was kind of like either a saltine, <laughs> don't, they don't know what that is, okay, a rectangular box <laughs> tipped on its side, which is pretty, uh, with the ballast, it's pretty fine. Or, but it, or it's a flat boat, you know, it has flat sides. And, it, and that's pretty much agreed on by everybody uh, today. But this is not right. So is it proper for us to show an inaccurate picture to our children? All right. Well, we're going to come back to this because there's a whole bunch of things wrong with the way we present this. And you're going to see that. Okay? <laughs> I don't think he had full-grown animals on there. There's nothing in the scriptures about there needing to be two full-grown animals. By the way, what did it say they were supposed to take on the ark? What was Noah supposed to take on the ark? Yeah, two of every kind, right? Now, is that two of every species? No. 
See, that's the big mistake that they make when they talk about this. It has to be two of every kind, the gene pool for that kind. That's bringing some other things up that we talked about earlier. So this didn't happen. We'll, go, we'll come back to that, though. This is one that I put together for somebody who is struggling with how we got the Bible, and I kind of like it myself. Uh, there is a special word in the New Testament for deity. Deity as opposed to humanity. How many people make up humanity on the earth today? I said it earlier. Are you not listening? <laughs> Eight billion. Okay. Eight billion personalities with different responsibilities, but they all make up humanity. How many make up deity? Three. And that's where people don't understand. There is a specific word for deity. There's a specific word for God the Father, for God the Son, and for God the Holy Spirit. So a lot of times people just use God for God the Father. But there are three individuals, as we would say it, within the Godhead with specific responsibilities. From the Godhead, there was a revelation that went to the apostles and prophets. The Bible and then to us. And that's where the argument is. Okay, you will find people arguing about every one of these terms. They will argue about God, they'll argue about God the Father, they'll argue about the Son, the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how many people I know that argue about whether they say, I'm not really sure there's a God. You know, what they mean is deity. They're not sure whether they believe that there is deity as opposed to humanity in the physical world. But they'll argue, and they'll have arguments for every one of these. They'll argue about the revelation, and, you know, we've talked some about that already. They'll talk about the apostles and prophets as just men. We've just talked about that. They'll talk about the Bible as being inaccurate because it was passed down from man to man and there were mistakes and so on. And then it gets to us. And so at every one of these uh, intervals, there's somebody who is, is trying to say it just can't be. So I've tried to give you some idea of that. The text was transmitted to us, all right, from the apostles and prophets. It was gathered into the Bible and then it was textually sent to us and not in not in our language all right there it was in a it was in an ancient language and i'll stick with the new testament for the time being i want to just define some terms original autographs are the letters that you found that your grandparents wrote to one another you can see where they signed it you can see their handwriting that's an original autograph we don't have anything like that for the bible there is not one thing that was penned by the Apostle Paul that we have. Nothing that was written by Jesus. He didn't write anything. Everybody wrote down what he said. All right, manuscripts, a copy of all or a part of the original autograph that's written in the original language. So if you have something from the Old Testament that's written in Aramaic or you have something from the New Testament that's written in Koenig Greek, all right, that's a copy of the original language. So that would be a manuscript, and that's pretty much all we have. Then we ha have a bunch of translations where you take a manuscript and you put it into a different language. And you can go to BibleGateway.com, and I'm not pushing that particular one, but you can go there and you can go and see the Bible given to you in all these different languages. It's really amazing. If you want to see it in Magyar, you can see it in Magyar. That's what the Hungarian people speak. All right, so uh, that's, that's just some terms I want you to be aware of. Original autographs, we, we don't have any of those. We do have manuscripts that are in the original language, and we have translations, and this is where you're more likely to run into a problem with man's interference. So. These are the kinds of things that people show. They never meant a lot to me. They just didn't, just didn't come across to me very well. These are manuscripts, you know. This is the earliest. 
Uh, it was on papyrus, and it was written on both sides. So in the scroll, they'd write on one side, and then they'd turn it over. So you couldn't just flip it over and see that same spot, okay? Um, they're all written in this different language right here. And so uh, I want to skip that for a minute. So this was another one that I saw, and it still didn't make much sense to me. All right. So I want to I want to look at some things here that are, are rather important. It, if you look at the the quotations of the New Testament by people who lived uh, very close to it, you are going to find out how many uh, actual references are made. Thirty six hundred. 36,298. Some people say that if you listen to the scriptures that atheists are knocking down, you would pretty much be able to put the whole Bible back together. You know, there are always passages that people focus in on. And the gist of it, the main points, are pretty much there, and people talk about them all the time, whether they believe in them or not. Okay? Uh, I want to show you this because this is very important. Now you don't know all these names, you know. You know Caesar, you you know Livy and Plato, you know Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Thucydides, etc. But I want you to see how this was put together. When it was written, the earliest copy, the earliest manuscript. All right. So you have Tacitus, the annual annual annals of Tacitus written in 100 A.D., but there's a 900-year a gap before we find the first copy. Now, to me, that's a gap, okay? And what you find is that's basically the kind of gap you find uh, on all of these things, including Caesar. Now, when I took Latin, I had to read Caesar. In Latin, and uh, Latin too, I had to read Caesar. I never once had a, a teacher or professor who said, you know, we're not really sure if this is true. Everybody believes that Caesar is true. And you know why they say that? Because there's no consequence to their life. You know, I, I know it, there's a lot of time between that first writing and when we got these first copies, but you know, it doesn't mean that it's going to change your life if you don't believe it. It's just something that you accept. And so I, that was what began to intrigue me about all of this. This is the statement by F.F. F. Bruce. Perhaps we can appreciate how wealthy, and I'm going to stick with the New Testament. The New Testament is in manuscript attestation, sorry. Uh, if we compare the textual material for other ancient historical works, that is a huge sentence. What it means is if you look at all these other people that wrote and compared them, you're going to get some idea of the New Testament. Uh, for Caesar's Gallic Wars, which were written a little bit before the Bible, there are several manuscripts. Only nine or ten are good. The oldest one is 900 years later than Caesar's day. So a little bit more information in there. The history of Thucydides and so on. So I decided to just focus in on Caesar and think about his Gallic Wars. That is one of the things I had to read. So, I don't know, maybe I'm taking out my frustrations on this one. Caesar's Gallic Wars, 58 to 50 BC. So here we have uh, from 0 to 1200 AD. And uh, there are no original autographs. All right, so you just have manuscripts. The first manuscript was found around 900 AD, and that's the gap that you have. All right. There's only nine or ten that are usable, not a complete manuscript out of any of them, and that out of any one of them, and basically the gap ends up being right at a thousand years. But we don't question it in our classes, do we? Never had anybody say that there was a question or could be a question about it. We just studied it as accurate history of the Gallic Wars. Okay? Nobody talked about, well, the scribes made a mistake. They passed that on to some, you know, none of that stuff. Just like our game. All right, so you have these people who are actually scribes. And they, like I said, they were artists. 
You just need to understand they were artists. And this is what they were copying for the New Testament. This is a piece of John, and, uh, and it, it's the earliest one that we know. And you can find a lot of information on this. I've seen some of these live, all right, in the various museums, like the Oriental Museum uh, in Chicago. Uh, and, you know, they're very, they're very, very interesting. This is a book that I have, which is basically the New Testament in Koine Greek, in case you thought it looked Greek to you. It is. All right, so I found, I, I just used that yesterday. Uh, Saturday night and then Sunday morning really early because I was trying to solve a problem and I had to get into the Koenig Greek. Now, I'm not fluid in it, but I can at least match up the words uh, with a concordance and so on. So here's the Bible. No original autographs. The first manuscript, though, is around 125 A.D. All right? And it's this kind of thing here. So the question really ends up being, how do you know that the text of the Bible that we have in our hands is what was actually delivered to the apostles and prophets? Now, I don't know, based on what we've said already, if you see where this is actually going. So I'm going to continue through it. So this is basically what we have. There's the Bible. And this is what we were talking about with that game of gossip. Single line passing it down, right? Right. So you can, uh, in the beginning was the word, that would have been a mistake. So we don't know whether something was deleted or added if this is the way we got it. So let's look at the way we got it. We have these people who basically were supposed to copy it like we copy a picture. Same colors, same shape for the letters. I doubt if many of them actually read it. They could, but they were artists. That was their purpose. Photocopiers for their, their generation. Uh, this is sort of how it came to us. You have an original, and the original was copied, and it was sent lots of different places. That's first generation. Then the second generation, one of these places sent it lots more places. Lots more places there all over the world. Third generation what some of these, it doesn't mean every one of them is like this. You understand? You can't put that on this chart. But every one of these things right here is it being sent all over the world. All right, so you have it in Spain, you have it in Turkey, you have it in Egypt, you have these manuscripts from everywhere. All right, so I, I, that still was not satisfactory to me. But uh, if you start looking at the ones that we have from the New Testament, what you find is that you find them in different generational, in different centuries, different time periods, and you find them from all over the, all over the world, okay? Yes, I can go through them. So you find the earliest ones. Whoa, what did I do? I've never had that happen. It's the computer. <laughs> if I can't blame my wife tonight, it is the computer. All right. So we come back and we have the we have this uh, we have the Bible, and that's how it was passed down. So how many manuscripts are there for the New Testament? There were nine or ten incomplete manuscripts for the Gallic Wars. You need to remember that no originals. Thousand years after, no complete manuscripts. Only nine or ten are reliable. So let's look at it on the New Testament. The Bible, no original autographs. Okay, that's pretty true for all of those things. First century, 50 years after the original uh, autograph is the, uh, which we do not have, okay, the autograph. But the first manuscript's just 50 years after, okay. There are four to five nearly complete manuscripts of the scriptures. I mean, whole New Testament now. It takes up about the amount of space as the New York Times Sunday version. There are four or five nearly complete manuscripts. And what if I told you instead of nine or ten, I told you we had 20 reliable manuscripts? Does that make you feel better? Okay. What if I said 200? Make you feel a little better? 
I can do that. I can up this. 2,000, you good with that? Well, let's look at 20,000 reliable manuscripts. Now, what, when you start putting this together, what, what are you dealing with here? This is where my little animation stuff disappeared. If you start cross-checking the different manuscripts from these different scribes in all of the countries and the different centuries, it allows you to be assured that the text of the Bible was the, what was actually delivered to the apostles and prophets. Now, there's only one little logical thing there that I didn't give you. So now we're going to play the game again, and I'm going to take that same statement, my original statement, my original autograph. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to give that same thing out in 50 different rooms where there are 50 people in each room. All right? So the first person's going to read it, whisper it in the next person's ear, et cetera, et cetera. If at the end you can go into the room and every person in every room says the same thing, what do you know? It has to be the original statement. What are the odds of having 50 rooms with 50 people? We have more than that for the Bible. 50 rooms with 50 people where anybody you point to will stand up and say, this is what it said. The last person will say, this is what it said. The first person says, yeah, that's what he gave me. You can be totally confident in a situation like that, that you have the truth of it and that it has not been changed, that it is what it is. And that's exactly the, what we're talking about in this particular lesson. If you start putting all of these manuscripts together, uh, no matter where you find them, what generation, John 1.1 1, 1 always reads the same way. 2 Timothy 3.7 reads the same way. You have 20,000 of these that you can put together. All right? And in all of these things, you find the same thing same themes. You have God and his creation, man. You have sin. You have Satan, sin, and redemption from the beginning to the end. Do you feel more confident now that maybe the Bible that you have is one that you can read and know that that's what God wanted you to know? I just want to say, I'm not crazy when it comes to this world. I think sometimes we forget that our own children are going to have to go through this growing up period where they're going to be faced with temptations that you and I, who are older, did not have to face. You know, drinking alcohol starts in the sixth grade, fifth grade. Kids start drinking alcohol. They start, uh, you know, huffing on these chemicals. They, they just start a lot of this stuff. Marijuana is everywhere. I don't know where they grow it, but it must be close. That was a joke. We're, we're, we're the huge producer of marijuana. Anyway, uh, it's just there, and it's, it's available, and the things they see on TV kind of glorify it, you know, and the movies they see kind of glorify all of that, you know. And so you have this idea of I'm going to live fast and hard and die early kind of thing. I'm going to live for myself, for my pleasures. And so we find a lot of kids who are completely self-absorbed. The only thing they care about is themselves. They don't care about anybody else. I'll tell you a story. Um, I know somebody who went to a big um, production that is done in front of Edinburgh Castle called the uh, the tattoo. And the tattoo, basically, th this year they said that they were kind of uh, honoring all of the colonies that the British government had ever had. So in Edinburgh, in front of the Edinburgh Castle, they set up a stage, and they, they had all of these people coming in where there were thousands of bagpipers and dancers and from every country, they did it a different way, but at the end, they all came together and played the same things. Some of the most amazing dancing I've ever seen, 
I mean, it was just amazing. And, I, and if you've never seen it, just look up the military tattoo. You'll find it on the web. But there was this person who was freezing to death because the weather was unusual and they were oriental. So probably they came to Scotland without understanding that it could get that cold. And my friend said it was really that cold. Had on a heavy coat, gloves, scarf, the whole thing. But the girl next to him began to tremble. She just was thin, you know, oriental. She just had no fat on her. And she just didn't have any way to protect herself. So he took off his gloves and his scarf and I think his coat, I think he had a big sweater on under it, and gave it to her so that she could warm herself. Well, he's telling one of his other friends about this. And the friend said, well, if she'd been sitting by me, she'd have been cold. No compassion, no feeling of sorrow or sympathy for what the lady was going through. And how many people will go home and then rant on their Facebook about how stupid that that person was that was sitting next to me. They were just stupid. You know, this idea of feeling alongside what people are going through, just having compassion, is such a great concept within the Scriptures. You know, to, you treat your neighbor as you would want them to treat you. And even if they don't, you're supposed to love them and continue to do what's right, even if they don't understand that's what comes from God. Now, if you want to know a way that you can help grow as a Christian, you basically, I would just challenge you tomorrow to do two things for people that you do not have to do that will take some of your time. You may not have money, but you, you have time. You don't think that you do, but you do. You see somebody, you know, whatever it is, I don't even know. Like, there's thousands and thousands of examples. Uh, but, you know, you will learn over time how to, how to deal with people who are lying to you. But sometimes they'll fool you, but that's all right. You did what you were supposed to do, whether they were honest or not. And God takes that into account. And just stop. Do two things tomorrow that you absolutely do not have to do, even, it's, even if it stretches your schedule a little bit. And then start doing two more for a month or so, and then do three, drop back to two, do five one day. Just get in the habit of doing uh, kind of unexpected good, th good things. You know, just those flashes, yes, this is right to do. You know, and you, then you'll think about those passages in James that say, you know, what does it do to say, be ye warmed and filled to somebody who doesn't have any food if you have a way to help them right then? You end up sinning. That's really what it boils down to. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And, you know, we, we just have got to try to help ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, to get out of this kind of it's all about me kind of generational thing. And you know, it, it's always been there. It's been in every it's been in every generation. If you look at the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, you have somebody who continually was doing things for other people because he was so compassionate, even though it ultimately uh, Ultimately, it was very bad for his own life. And he, was, and he was on the verge of committing suicide. But that means that there were some really selfish, mean, mean uh, people with a mean attitude, the bullies that were in there, who, who lied and cheated and stole and so on. And this, and this guy did nothing but walk around doing good for people. And he, it changed his whole life because all of his dreams got put on hold so he could take care of it. Well, if you look at, if you look at the story of Stephen, and, and when, before he was stoned, he was given a lesson to the Jews. And one of the things he said was, Jesus, 
You know, you've crucified the Lord of hosts. You've crucified Jesus, a man who went about doing good. You want to know what Christianity is? That's it. You become a person who simply goes about doing good. You know, my hat's off to the person who gave clothes to this girl. And I feel incredibly sorry for the soul of the person who was so hard-hearted they wouldn't do it. They'd have let that girl sit there and freeze. And there's a number of ways you could have done it even without taking off your own clothes. You could have gone down and asked the people, you know, in the emergency medical thing whether they had any of those, you know, kind of space blankets, the silver ones, for her to be able to put it around herself. There's a number of ways to skin the cat when you're trying to do good. So the lesson is yours. And I hope that some of these comments will make you think about how you are going to approach life. You can approach it in fear of people. You can approach it selfishly if you want to. You have the opportunity and the right to do that. God gave you that right. You have free will. But I would highly recommend that you try to get down to that same statement being made about you when you die, that you were a person who went about doing good. <coughs> Thanks, guys. I will take some questions. We've been doing five questions. I'll take four questions because some people are slipping these extra questions in there. <laughs> you may not have as many questions about this. You do see my point. There is nothing about the Bible. There's not another book that is anywhere close to the Scriptures of a library of 66 books by different people over a span of 1,500 years that doesn't have a contradiction and has this theme of five themes running through it from the beginning to the end. That's why we call it the book.